intellectual property is imaginary property and a violation of the non-aggression principle. Let's go talk about it. In modern societies, intellectual property is often discussed as though it is just as real or valid as any other form of property. And I'm gonna walk you through exactly why not only is that not the case, but this illusion and violent enforcement is actually stifling innovation and causing a lot of the inequalities that exist that most people attribute to other confusing things such as the idea of capitalism or the free market. So let's dig into why intellectual property doesn't exist. First, let's address this idea that if you can't touch it, it's not property. Intellectual property is given its own designation because without the term intellectual, which means thought or idea, because it's not actually tangible, there are only two types of property that are recognized under the law. One is real physical property, something that you can touch, buy, transport, create. It requires resources, it exists, it can be damaged, it can be transferred. And then there's intellectual property, which has none of these traits. It is an idea, a concept, something that has been written down on paper in some sort of description. And that concept has been protected under the violence of the state. This is where it breaks down. And the fact that you've been conditioned essentially your entire life to believe that ideas or imaginary concepts are just as valid and worthy of protection as your actual physical tangible property is part of the reason why there is so much confusing inequality that exists in the world. Now, before I go down a rabbit hole of this, as I refer abstractly to this idea of equality, I don't mean that everyone should have equality of outcome, nor that everyone should even be treated the same. What I mean by equality is that people are being arbitrarily treated different based on whether or not they are willing or able to use the violence of the state in order to protect their means of making an income. I, I see this all the time, and as someone who went to college, got a degree in engineering, and went to work in the engineering field, it can be somewhat confusing to put a lot of time and effort into an intellectually rigorous field like engineering, and then turn around and see people who play games <laughs> making millions of dollars. Athletes, celebrities who play make-believe. I hear this a lot from people in every field, people that are in the medical field, nurses and doctors, people who make a good living. I'm not gonna argue or complain that I make a good living. I, I do as an engineer, but you often look at it and be like, well, why does a doctor who saves someone's life day in and day out make $250,000 a year? And someone who plays a game earns $10 million a year. And the answer, is intellectual property, 100% across the board. It's true of celebrities in music, movies, sports. All of those fields, all of those markets are tightly protected against any sort of competition by intellectual property. And because of that, prices can be kept arbitrarily high. Ultimately, anything you see in the world that doesn't make sense almost certainly has some aspect of violence behind it. Intellectual property is one of those things where without the application of violence against peaceful people, intellectual property simply cannot exist and the open marketplace of ideas would be allowed to run wild and create a plethora of competing ideas where only the best ideas would win out, not simply the first ideas to market that are then protected for 50 or 75 years by the law. Now, the primary argument in favor of intellectual property laws and originally the reason why it was actually put into the United States Constitution is because there was this rather incorrect idea that without some sort of legal protection for innovators to protect and have a monopoly on bringing ideas to market, it would stifle innovation and people wouldn't want to take on the risk and financial burden of innovating and bringing a brand new product to market when you could go through the trouble of doing research, design, tooling up to produce something and bring it to market, and then a week later somebody copies it and undercuts you and edges you out of the market. That's the primary argument for intellectual property. Now, let's just 
take a very simple example that exists in current times and show you how that's in fact not the case even with intellectual property laws in place right now. For instance, Apple, and I'm going to keep my own personal opinions on Apple products to myself for the purpose of this, but that Apple was the first to come to market with the first widely accepted smartphone. They innovated, created something new, cost them a lot of money to produce it, came to market. Now, without having 50 years of intellectual property protection against the idea of a smartphone, there are dozens of competitors in the market. Prices have honestly gone up, not down, but the overall quality, the overall features available in smartphones in the market has gone up. Has Apple failed to innovate? Has Apple been discouraged from competing in this market? No. They release new innovations every year to compete with other products that are trying desperately to drive them out of the market. Because of that, high technology fields that do not have this restriction on competition and innovation are allowed to explode and we have this extremely rapid advancement in technology and in things that make our life easier. This is another really important aspect of intellectual property, is this idea of theft. You can't have stolen anything if nothing was taken away from another person, right? So if I have an idea in my head, if I say the numbers 147, that idea exists, and if you then say, oh, 147, you haven't stolen my idea, you haven't stolen my property. It's not something physically tangible that has been taken from me. If you take my shirt, my wonderful Malcolm Reynolds shirt, off my back, then you have taken my property. But the person who designed this shirt, and I actually bought this shirt from a fundraiser that Nathan Fillion, the actor that was playing Malcolm Reynolds did, where he sold these shirts and donated the proceeds to charity, but there's not anything on this shirt that says anything copywritten. It doesn't say Firefly, and as far as I'm aware, it is unlikely that Nathan Fillion paid any sort of royalties to Fox, who owns the Firefly license for this, because it falls under fair use without reusing some of the logos. But the point being, this is dangerous territory with intellectual property. If you take some piece of imaginary idea property, and even if you create something completely original, some artist, they created a derivative work. Now there are, th there are things in the law that allow things, things like fair use, but these are timid exceptions to what is otherwise an extremely violent enforcement of this idea that ideas are something that must be protected. Another good example of how bad intellectual property is as far as a violation of the non-aggression principle, let's say I have this shirt. Say I bought this shirt without a design on it, just a plain brown shirt. You would probably say it's my property. No argument there, right? Let's say I take a Sharpie and I draw a line across my shirt. That Sharpie that I bought my property, that shirt, still my property. I put them together, it's not somebody else's property. If I take that Sharpie, if I draw the logo for Marvel, right, something that is copywritten, something that is trademarked, the argument with intellectual property is that that Sharpie has transformed the t-shirt, which is my property, into something that is now someone else's property. Specifically, if I were to turn around and take that shirt and sell it to someone else. Most people would not argue that if I bought a plain t-shirt and then I decided I didn't want it anymore and I sold it to someone else, that would be okay. If I buy a t-shirt, I paint a logo on it that is protected by intellectual property with stuff that I own and then sell it to someone else, all of a sudden there are people who would say that I have stolen from them. And this is fundamentally the problem with intellectual property and why it is a violation of the non-aggression principle. Having competition doesn't discourage new products in the market. But one thing that intellectual property does do is protect inferior products in the market. Things like Star Wars, Star Trek, Marvel, fan fiction, the NFL, the MLB, the NBA. You cannot compete with these things because you will be attacked into oblivion by the violence of the state if you even try to get anywhere near things like this. And because of that, you often get franchises and licenses that are stagnant. You often get Firefly, a series greatly beloved by all the peoples who have ever seen it. And because Fox holds the license for it and won't let go because they still get those sweet, sweet royalties off of every time someone buys a Blu-ray or a DVD of Firefly or Serenity or it gets aired on TV, because they are protecting that license, derivative works, people who would 
even be willing to hire the actors who are happy to get back into the series and do something right by it, cannot do so because the license is protected and locked down and you cannot create new ideas or derivative ideas on that without your peaceful, personal, private, tangible property being physically and violently infringed on by the state. Hopefully, this was a good brief introduction to uh, why intellectual property is a violation of the non-aggression principle and why intellectual property, in fact, does not exist. It is imaginary. If you guys enjoyed this information, be sure to stick around for more. We'll see you in the next one.